Welcome to the 26th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2022. Our first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Are members content to take agenda item three in private? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two is to take evidence on the annual report laid in draft by the Scottish Ministers in exercise of the power in the UK withdrawal from the EU Continuity Scotland Act 2021. And we are joined remotely this morning by Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, George McPherson, Head of EU Policy and Alignment of the Scottish Government, Rosemary Greenhill, Regulatory Team Leader, Drinking Water Quality Scottish Government and Lorraine Walkinshaw, Lawyer, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And a warm welcome to you all. And Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to make a brief opening statement? Oh, can you? With you, I, I join you from Scotland House in, uh, in London, where I'm for holding meetings with the, the UK Government. So thank you for accommodating me, uh, joining you uh, remotely this morning. Today, uh, we are focusing on the European Union, in particular, our report on how the Scottish Government is using the EU Continuity Act to protect and maintain the high standards we enjoyed as a member state of the European Union. Uh, we are committed to remaining close to the EU and to building the strongest possible relationship between the EU and Scotland. And I think it is important that we consider here why that is. Alignment is, of course, a point of principle and conviction. Scotland's attachment to the European Union has been demonstrated at the ballot box time and time again. And if the latest polls are to be believed, that desire to remain close to Europe is uh, doing nothing other than increasing. Uh, because the people of Scotland see what is at stake and understand the devastating effect that Brexit and not just the calamitous litany of successive UK governments is having on the country. But above all else, alignment is about protecting the well-being of the people of Scotland and our standards shared with and shaped by the EU are among the most advanced world. They protect the environment, people's working conditions, the safety and quality of the food that we eat, and, uh, as we will see, the water that we drink. Uh, the Scottish Government's policy of maintaining alignment with the EU where we can, and it makes sense to do that, is protecting those standards. This can happen in a number of ways. The Continuity Act power we're discussing today is only one such vehicle and only one part of the story. Uh, this is done also via other legislative means or by changes to non-legislative guidance, policy and programmes and taking to get reference to the standards enjoyed by people in Scotland. In this regard, I'd like to thank the committee for sharing the research carried out by Queen's University in order to establish a potential baseline of EU legislation passed since Scotland was forced to leave the European Union. We'll carefully examine the research produced and the recommendations that have been made. Uh, but I would note that it is important to remember that Scotland's approach to alignment is to align where possible and where it is within Scotland's interest to do so. And this requires careful consideration as to the extent and the method by which Scotland should align in order to achieve the outcomes that we share with the EU. Where that's by legislation, as you know, Parliament has agreed our statement of policy provide transparency in terms of information in relevant policy notes and consultations. And I'm grateful that both the civil service and the parliamentary officials are discussing how this can be taken forward. But alignment isn't just about legislation and standards. It's about the, the vision that we share with the European Union for the continent's future, uh, its part in the world, tackling the climate emergency, sustainable growth, and supporting Ukraine as just some examples by the outcomes that our intervention support and consideration of alignment and the international dimension is an integral part of our approach to policy making. This commitment to align is made all the more important by the devastating project that we see emerging from Westminster. Uh, we all need to wake up to what the retained EU law bill will mean. In its current form, it's less about taking back control from Brussels and more an attempt to dismantle the high standards Scotland and the UK has enjoyed as a result of our former membership of the European Union. 
Cabinet Secretary, I, I wonder. So, undermining the we were told. Oh, can you switch camera off, please? We can't. Yeah. In, in, in Cabinet Secretary, I don't think you can hear me. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I suspend the meeting? So we, yeah. You hear me? Okay. Thank you and welcome back to the committee. Um, we are going to try to resume questions to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, if the Cabinet Secretary um, could repeat the last few minutes of his opening statement, that would be very welcome as we weren't able to hear it. That's very kind, Convener. I hope you can hear me. Uh, now I was beginning to uh, come to the end of my statement, but talk uh, briefly about uh, both the retained EU law bill, because of the relevance it has on uh, Scotland remaining aligned with the European Union, and uh, briefly touch on a number of report-related issues. So, if you're still hearing me, I will, I will, I will conclude, uh, convener. Uh, the implications of the retained EU law bill may have for our approach to preserve and advance what we uh, have are profound, and it will remain to be seen what impact the retained EU law bill will have on Scotland's ability to act in its own devolved interests. But the rule bill means divergence. And to paraphrase Vice President Sefcovic's comments last week to the EU-UK Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, where he said, divergence will carry even more cost 
and will further deepen the barriers to trade between the EU and the UK. Divergence means more friction and less trade. It's as simple as that. And again, this in times of severe economic strains. So in taking forward um, alignment in Scotland, I'm determined that we proceed in a way which others can understand. So much of this can feel arcane to our fellow citizens. And that's why I welcome today's hearing uh, and why our policy statement agreed by Parliament in June last year commits us to going beyond the requirements of the Continuity Act, providing detail on the impact of our commitment to align in respect of all relevant legislation brought forward. We want to ensure that Parliament and the public understand how and where EU standards are being preserved and advanced in Scotland. And I commend that parliamentary officials are working with my own to ensure that we apply this commitment effectively, uh, because it's by working together well in this way that we'll have the best chance of delivering our shared interest in allowing the Scottish Parliament to fulfil the role it has assigned in the devolution settlement. Very briefly on the report before you today, uh, it, um, uh, the report laid in draft for you to consider uh, covers how the Section 1 regulation making powers uh, ha ha have been used in the last reporting period. That's the 1st of September to 31st of August 22. And as I've explained, this is a, a subset of the application of alignment overall. The most important development is that we're now taking forward planned use in respect of World Health Organization requirements on the quality of water intended for human consumption as detailed in the European Union recast drinking water directive. And this is a really good example of how we're applying our commitments in terms of alignment. We're able to align with provisions of the recast drinking water directive using the most effective powers available to us in a way that protects and advances standards. And this example also demonstrates that there are aspects of EU directives uh, in which we have to carefully consider how and when we implement and the section of the report detailing, detailing considered use over the reporting period, in this case on decarbonisation, does likewise. The detail of the, the water quality regulations are, of course, a matter for Michael Matheson's portfolio and the Net Zero Committee. Uh, but I'm very grateful to be accompanied by civil service colleagues from Environment and the EU Secretariat today. And we'll do our best to answer your questions on the, on the report and help consider any written representations the committee might uh, wish to make. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And we can hear you, so hopefully um, that will continue for the rest of the session this morning. We won't have any more disruption. Um, I wonder if I could out-reflect on your opening statement uh, and your comments on, on the research that was commissioned by our committee in terms of... Um, informing um, the, the, the wider public and um, our, ourselves, the Parliament, about, about some of the decisions and some of the, the law that has passed in the EU. Um, we also heard evidence that the dashboard from Westminster doesn't seem to cover devolved areas. So um, I was wondering if, if you agreed that there need to, needed to be more information. Uh, you did say, say the report was just part of, of the picture, but how can... Um, you know, um, stakeholders, Civic Scotland, examine the decision making that's happening at the moment. And um, would you agree that it's almost as important to know what's not been taken forward as it is to know what has been taken forward by the government and whether you would reflect on that? So, convener, there's quite a lot in your question there. Uh, firstly, I would say that uh, we, so I, firstly, I'm going to answer the, the question in the context of. Uh, our endeavours to remain aligned prior to the um, the application of the um, retained EU law bill by the UK government, uh, and uh, rather than conflate the two, so in, in the first uh, instance about uh, how things currently stand, I think we're beginning to find our way. Uh, through the process of alignment, realising that we can do that in a number of, of different ways, uh, not all of which obviously involve uh, legislation. Um, and we have a reporting mechanism in place uh, to Parliament uh, with myself and colleagues answering to you um, and providing background material uh, to illustrate um, uh, the issue in, in, in general and specific terms. The, the fact that it's a work in progress, I think, is, uh, is evidenced by the fact that there are ongoing discussions between uh, Scottish Government and, and parliamentary officials about 
uh, how, how we can um, uh, improve uh, as we go forward in, in a fine-tuning sense. So there's that. Um, and that, I suppose, is the formal context for today's evidence session. But we have this massive issue casting a shadow over this process uh, and alignment more generally, which is the uh, retained EU law bill, which is currently going through the Westminster Parliament. And I think members of the committee understand that what, what this, in effect, does um, is to force parliaments, uh, whether the UK Parliament um, or the Scottish Parliament in devolved areas, uh, to make a decision about the entirety of European Union law. So not just legislative proposals by the EU that have been made since Brexit. Now we're having to look right back through effectively 47 years of European Union membership and legislation passed during that time, which is on our statute book, and for us to make decisions about all of those. And that takes us into a totally, totally new situation. I agree that both the, the, the prior and what is coming situation are related, especially from your perspective, um, convener, and, and colleagues on the committee who are going to want to make sure that you're able to scrutinize all of this. But the scale of this will not be lost on you, because it certainly isn't on me. Uh, when speaking to the previous minister with responsibility for this, Jacob Rees-Mogg, he couldn't even tell me how many pieces of legislation uh, were in devolved areas. We know that, roughly speaking, Previously avowed totals of EU legislation were about 2,500. The Financial Times has in the last week or so published a report uh, suggesting that it may be considerably higher than that, uh, way beyond 3,000 pieces of legislation. But we've had no information from the UK government and have asked about how many of those are in, in devolved areas. Uh, so on, on working on the assumption that this bill goes forward, not and that notwithstanding the fact that the Scottish Parliament um, is being asked to withhold legislative consent, but as we know, the UK government has been prepared to override the Seoul Convention repeatedly. Um, if they were to do that again, if they were not to accept amendments that would carve out Scotland from the process, which would be the easiest way of retaining EU legislation, so our alignment in effect um, as, a, as a status quo position, we will then, as a government, uh, and then we as a parliament, and you as a committee, are going to have to find totally new ways uh, to manage the, uh, the historic alignment of Scotland uh, legislation and the European Union. And this will be, without doubt, a massive undertaking, because we will need to firstly identify which are the active pieces of legislation uh, that we would wish to see retained. Um, we would need to evaluate in which way would we need to act, make sure that they remain on our statute book. Is that something that requires primary legislation, secondary legislation, statutory instruments, and, and the, the, the whole uh, kit and caboodle? Um, and the, this is a, a, a process which is also being faced by uh, other devolved um, uh, uh, governments. I spoke this week with my opposite number in the Welsh um, government, McAntonew, uh, and we, we were discussing the scale of the challenge um, and the beginnings of the thinkings of how, how one would, would manage our way through the process. And I just share with the committee, you know, we are at the start of a long, frankly, unnecessary road um, to try and maintain alignment by having to protect the historic legislative um, framework of our entire European Union membership. So it's taking us into, uh, into all altogether new territory. Okay, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. We begin our um, evidence on the retained EU law bill next week. As a committee, we will be returning to that. So um, if we can move to questions on the annual report from our committee, and I would introduce first Mr Cameron. Good morning, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'm delighted to hear that you're um, in London meeting UK government um, ministers and officials. Um, 
on, on the subject of uh, keeping pace, um, you spoke at the start about, I think you mentioned the words principle and conviction about staying close to Europe. Um, but you've chosen in the annual report not to align with EU legislation. And so it appears that although your government's stated intention is to align with EU law, it's not the policy you're, you're following. And in this instance, in the EU Energy Performance and Buildings Directive, and I think that approach is commendable, um, but it does leave a huge question mark for Scottish businesses, organisations, Civic Scotland, and uncertainty if they don't know whether the Scottish Government is going to align or not. And I just would like your response, please, to, to that point. Uh, well, firstly, I wouldn't want the um, impression to, to be created uh, that there isn't a general position of uh, wishing to uh, re remain aligned with uh, the policy and initiatives of the European uh, Union. That That is the case. And I could draw your attention to a whole series of examples from single-use plastic regulations um, to food and feed safety, um, and, and I could go on. Uh, you've chosen to uh, uh, pick up on one particular uh, issue uh, in terms of uh, building regulations, and I think I'm right in saying uh, the provision of uh, electric vehicle charging measures, and I'll, I'll signal to other colleagues uh, who, are on the, who are on the line if they want to add anything after uh, what I have to say uh, on the subject. Um, but if I can just briefly address the, 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 the specific point on um, the, the use of uh, electric vehicle infrastructure regulations in the last annual report, um, the Scottish Government did not consider using the powers for this regulation over the period of the last report. Uh, and consideration of using the power was in relation to its potential application during this reporting year now ended. The implications of measures proposed in the EU legislation um, still need to be carefully considered in terms of the outcomes uh, they will support. I think we all understand that uh, the pivot towards electric vehicles is very much an ongoing situation. Um, and in this specific case, it was important to consider the evidence held in reaching a decision on our approach to EV charging in this case, aligning with the regulation in question would not support the outcome sought within the transposition uh, timescale. And we may seek to align at a later date, uh, and we're com committed to keeping this matter uh, under uh, review. So, as I've said to the committee a number of times before, we are uh, committed to remaining aligned uh, in the broadest of senses. Um, but there will be specific measures that come forward, which for a number of technical reasons um, uh, may not need to be um, introduced in their entirety or at this particular point in time, um, um, because uh, it, we are not following a blanket alignment policy with 100% uh, transposition of, of everything, not least because a lot of measures don't impact on Scotland in any way whatsoever. Um, but that, that's my answer to Mr. Cameron's question. Are there any um, colleagues on the call who would li like to add any other technical insight into the particular um, uh, regulation that Mr. Cameron's asked about? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I've got no visual um, indication of this. Um, they would have to put um, into the chat. Uh, so, can we bring in Mr. McPherson, please? Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to follow on what the Cabinet Secretary uh, stated, I think the important point there is, is that it is not always possible um, for Scotland to align with the European Union due to the fact that we are now not part of, of many of the, the structures um, and uh, uh, frameworks that were in place when we were a member state, um, as we are now obviously outside of the European Union. Um, so in particular cases, we need to carefully consider how and, and when we align. And in some cases, the, the process of doing that may not actually result in the outcome that we are seeking to achieve. Um, in this particular case, in terms of EV charging infrastructure, my understanding is that um, the, the purpose of the EU regulation was in order to make sure that it was, it was easier to install EV charging infrastructure and make sure that there's availability of EV charging infrastructure 
um, uh, for a large part in new build buildings. But um, in the case of that particular area, I believe that the evidence indicated that there's a significant level of investment taking place in those areas anyway. Um, and the regulation itself would not necessarily improve or increase, or the evidence did not show that it would improve or increase access to EV charging points. So the decision was made to um, ensure that we monitor that particular position and then consider whether alignment is something that should happen at a later date. Um, on the, on the sort of wider point, I think that the, the deputy convener asked um, uh, around, you know, how our business is supposed to know, or or how are people supposed to know where we are aligning and where we are not. Um, the Scottish government brings forward legislation that's one way of of aligning, and that will detail um, where measures are being taken. Um, but there's other areas as well, such as policy announcements. It, it could be um, agreements with other organisations in order to deliver services. These would these would detail alignment in a wider sense. Um, and obviously, the, the purpose of that is to provide information to the general public and provide information to Parliament. So, um, these would be the areas in which I would believe that you would want to consider whether the Scottish Government was aligning, um, rather potentially than, than looking at what the European Union was doing, um, because obviously action would be required on the part of the Scottish Government to ensure that alignment was actually taking place. Thank you for thank you for both those those contributions. Can I move on to the um, work that the committee has begun in terms of tracking uh, EU legislation? Uh, and the cabinet secretary mentioned this in in the, his opening. But we are about to embark on a very wide administrative task of trying to track EU legislation on behalf of the Parliament, which will involve a um, huge amount of staff and, and resources. But that work cannot exist in a vacuum. Uh, and it is, of course, a response to the Scottish Government's uh, policy uh, to align. And it's not for us as a parliament to lead this work. We're here to scrutinise um, government. And I just would like um, both the Cabinet Secretary and any officials to give more detail than is present in the annual report about the work the Scottish Government is doing uh, to analyse EU legislation to track it. Um, and, and, and especially, as has been mentioned, that there are various routes to alignment, not just the, the power that we're considering today. Cabinet Secretary, do you want to start? I will, and I, I, I draw members' attention for those who weren't present to my previous evidence to the committee uh, and reflecting on my decade-long membership of the UK Scrutiny Committee that uh, literally went through hundreds, if not thousands, of documents uh, a year uh, to satisfy the UK Parliament that European uh, legislative proposals had gone through the scrutiny mechanism. And I was reflecting when I gave that evidence on the fact that I thought it was a profoundly um, uh, unsatisfactory way of um, par par providing parliamentary or oversight um, in, in a digital age and given the, the, the scale of... Um, of, of regulatory oversight that was uh, required. So the Scottish Government has taken a position that th that kind of very bureaucratic approach is not the best way um, of, of doing things. Of course, we know that all EU legislation is published on the EU's websites, um, but we also know that the scope of EU legislation is vast uh, and that much of it is technical and that it is not directly applicable uh, in Scotland. So alignment is, as I think everybody knows, is a policy decision for ministers and is not a legislative requirement. Um, and a commitment to produce a report by the Scottish Government setting out whether we have aligned or not in each instance where the EU makes legislation was not included in the, in the policy statement presented to and agreed by Parliament. Um, it would be impractical. It would... Um, take significant resource, and such detail does not assist ministers in applying the discretionary alignment policy against the Scottish Government's strategic priorities. Having said that, I am very sympathetic to the point that uh, Mr Cameron uh, makes about the challenge that uh, that, that then um, uh, provides to the committee in trying to identify particular areas where uh, a greater scrutiny by the committee uh, may be wished for. And that is the area where I am very keen that my officials and colleagues from the, the, the committee and parliament side of uh, the aisle um, are able to progress uh, work uh, to make sure that we can get that balance 
uh, right. So on the one hand, not massively bureaucratic and time consuming, um, and on the other hand, uh, giving enough uh, insight and understanding beyond what is required by the Scottish Government and is being fulfilled by the Scottish Government in reporting to Parliament uh, about the decisions that we are making and, and the fact that I am giving evidence uh, yet again on this on this question is, is uh, un underlining part of the, the process that we have for, for going through this. I, 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 I think it would be important just to stress again um, the, the wider context of this now, uh, given what is heading in our direction in terms of the uh, retained EU legislation challenge um, that the rule bill uh, presents for us, and I will be absolutely frank with the committee that I, I think we will need to think very long and hard about how we are able to best understand what does impact in Scotland in terms of historic legislation, and that may inform um, the ongoing process about the continuing alignment process with new EU um, proposals. So uh, if there are specific uh, suggestions about how we can make that uh, as workable as we can make it, I'm very open to working with the committee because it is, it is correct to say that it is in all of our interests be able to do that with maximum transparency and, and efficiency, and we're going to have to work very hard to try and find the best way of doing that. I would say, incidentally, also, that I think it would be a good idea probably to reach out and speak with colleagues in Wales, and hopefully when devolved government is re-established in Northern Ireland, um, that we can share best practice um, as, as governments. Um, and also as parliaments, and then with this new added layer of, of challenge in, re in relation to historic European Union legislation, and, and not just in terms of um, uh, uh, newer proposals from EU institutions that we are trying to remain aligned with. I believe Mr McPherson wants to come in on this point. Thank you, Convener. Um, I was just to add to what the Cabinet Secretary said, um, on the on the part on the, uh, the the subject of transparency, um, uh, two things to sort of mention. One is again the, the cabinet secretary's point about um, alignment being a policy commitment, not a legislative commitment, and and the second one being the policy statement that was passed by um, the Scottish Parliament in in June. In this, this committed the Scottish Government to providing information um, alongside relevant legislation. Um, that would help explain exactly what its relevance to EU alignment was. Um, specifically, we've been looking at um, the business and regulatory impact assessment, which has now been updated, not just in terms of EU alignment, but also to cons consider also the impact that the UK Internal Market Act may have, um, and also expand on, on earlier updates that were made in terms of Scotland's international uh, obligations. Um, this is literally at the final stages, I believe, of, of being released, and, and that will happen very shortly. Um, in addition to the business and regulated impact assessment, we committed to providing information and relevant policy notes that accompany legislation. Um, so this will set out the relevance to um, European Union law and how this, how this is relevant to the Scottish Government's um, commitment to align with the European Union where possible, or where it is in Scotland's interest to do so and where we have the power to do so. Um, and also to highlight as well that we're committed to providing a commentary um, early in the new year around um, the Commission work programme for uh, uh, 2023 um, and in subsequent years as well. And this will reflect on the high level plans that the Commission have made for the legislative priorities for the year ahead. And it will highlight where the Scottish Government um, at, that, at this particular point expects to take action to align. Um, it can set out where uh, potentially we may not be able to align, or it may set out where at that particular point we, we think further consideration is, is perhaps required. But the idea being that the Commission Work Programme um, commentary will, will set out an idea about where alignment may take place over the coming year. Um, the information provided alongside legislation will set out clearly exactly where alignment is relevant. Um, and um, in addition to that, this will also be carried forward by uh, the business and regulatory impact assessment that will set out how the policy options have been considered and how alignment is being considered in that particular case. Um, and I should also mention that where uh, this information is, is being included in these other areas, um, we would expect that that also feeds through into public consultation as well. 
um, as this would also reflect the, the approach that we take with the, uh, the business and regulatory impact assessment the BRIA. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of time as we are limited this morning um, due to the Cabinet Secretary's commitment. So we do have every other member of the committee wanting back in. So um, can I go to Miss, if we could be succinct and not repeat points already made by the Cabinet Secretary, that would be very helpful. Uh, Miss Boyack. Thanks very much. Um, I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary and his team are able to see the, the work that we're doing on it. It's very clear that it's uh, we need as much transparency as possible. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, the discussion so far has been about where we intend to align or where you intend to align as a government. Can you also clarify where you don't intend to align? Because I think that is as critical to businesses and environmental organisations or um, people who need to know where EU law will continue to apply and critically where you're not um, convinced that we should retain alignment. Uh, well, I, I would draw um, Ms Boyack's attention to the report uh, as, as published, in part, uh, to answer that uh, question, because it gives, it gives an example of, of, um, uh, of where not, and I also drew attention uh, to that in my opening uh, statement. In the, the list of EU legislation that does not apply uh, to Scotland, just because of geographical um, uh, uh, proximity uh, or because it relates to specific regulations uh, for industries or agriculture, for example, that has no direct impact for, um, for Scotland uh, whatsoever, and is, is an illustration of why having an exhaustive list of uh, regulations that do not apply um, is is not the effective and efficient way uh, forward um, for uh, the government in terms of uh, the transparency process that we are we are keen uh, to um, deliver and and you just heard from my uh, colleague uh, outlined uh, to the committee in terms of people wanting an understanding of uh, what regulations. Uh, actually are as pertain in Scotland. If we take the electronic vehicle um, uh, example, well, people know exactly what the regulations are in Scotland. Um, so um, I, I'm not entirely sure what it, how it is that we, we would be proceeding in a way to satisfy Ms Boyack's um, concern, but I underline the fact that you know if there are better ways in which um, uh, this process can be explained uh, to the committee and through committee to parliament, then I am very open to uh, our officials uh, making suggestions about um, uh, how that uh, might be and uh, take that on board and, um, and introduce them if they are practical and proportionate. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. It's the issue about where you've decided uh, not to align and you say it would be too much work to routinely scrutinise everything, but surely there needs to be a process whereby Parliament can at least ask questions about in which category you've decided to align and why not. Um, and you've just made a couple of, you've given us a couple of policy issues in terms of industry or agriculture, but shouldn't that be tested? Shouldn't that be visible so that people can agree or disagree with that decision that the government is considering to make? Shouldn't we have a, a clarity of process and timing on this issue? Uh, well, with the greatest respect, I mean, I think the uh, the procedure uh, is uh, clear in as much as we are reporting to, to Parliament, we are reporting as part of our legislative uh, process. Uh, I am back in front of the uh, committee and we are currently in, in, engaged in an ongoing process of if there are specific ways in which we can provide even more in, um, uh, increased transparency and satisfy the demands, which I appreciate c committee members have, having sat in their position doing the same, exactly the same job in the United Kingdom uh, Parliament. I'll definitely reflect on um, uh, how do we ensure that if there are things, if there are major proposals where they may have a relevance um, uh, to Scotland, and we have decided uh, uh, for whatever reason that might be, that legislation isn't required uh, to be aligned, uh, being an example, um, that that can be shared um, uh, as well. Maybe that's part of the process that our, our um, uh, committee officials and Scottish Government colleagues 
um, need to uh, address directly. But I'm, I, I, I am not aware of anything that has crossed my desk uh, where a decision has been made that one will not seek to align through um, uh, adopting policy or legislation that has not been reported. Um, but were that to be the case, I would want to make sure that um, people are properly informed. And I you know, will take that away and I will uh, reflect to make sure that that is, in fact, uh, what happens. Uh, it is what I believe to be current uh, custom and practice. That would be helpful because in Table 1 of the report we've done, it does give a list of key areas. Environment protection, animal health, welfare, chemicals, plant health, food standards, police and judicial cooperation. That's just in a few of the issues and alignment or not in all of those areas are devolved. So just thinking about the information the Scottish Government will have held over the last 23 years does start off with a database. So we'd be very interested in feedback from the Cabinet Secretary about clarity, timing for both alignment and non-alignment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyer. Can I bring in Dr. Allen? Thank you, Convener. Um, um, Cabinet Secretary, I appreciate we're here to talk about primarily the, the report, but you did mention in your opening remarks that um, if Scotland wasn't carved out of the, um, the retained EU law bill, then you would need to look at, I think you said, totally new approaches for keeping pace in some areas. Uh, so I can ask what, whether there's been any indication whatsoever from the the UK government regarding their intentions and whether they would intend to, to do any carving at all, uh, and uh, if not, what those other options might be that the Scottish Government would have to pursue and what the, the likely scale of that task would be. Well, <clears throat> thank, thank Dr Allen for uh, his question. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm in a slightly uh, curious position in that I've received, um, I've received um, assurances uh, from the UK government that the Sewell Convention will be respected in relation to retained EU uh, law and the bill that is going through the UK Parliament. And if it's the case that the Scottish Parliament does not give legislative consent, you, you would imagine that in normal circumstances that would mean that the bill would not proceed as currently drafted. Uh, you, you would imagine then that if that commitment is taken at face value that the UK government would be prepared to amend itself or accept amendments um, that have already been tabled in the House of Commons uh, this week. Uh, I have not yet had an indication whether the UK government is actually prepared to do that, because as committee members can appreciate, um, what we could save ourselves a lot of work um, in Scotland, uh, given it's uh, the position uh, to try and remain aligned, and that means trying to um, protect the, legisla the legislative framework uh, that we have inherited um, as a past member state of the European Union, that if the UK government was serious about working collegially so that we can deliver on our respective mandates um, and priorities, that by framing UK legislation to actually reflect that, uh, would be the best solution. Now, I'm still working towards trying to make that happen. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what is still a relatively new Prime Minister and other ministerial colleagues, whether they take a different view to their uh, predecessors. Uh, so we, we don't know the answer to that yet, Dr. Allen. Um, uh, and in the meantime, I and, and my Welsh colleague um, have, and that was the purpose of our discussion this week, are, are trying to renew our efforts to uh, help the UK government understand that we, we do not want to see them continue as, as, um, as they have planned to, uh, and very much hope that the new Prime Minister and colleagues will listen to and respect that, and, and notwithstanding that, um, that they will uh, actually live up to uh, a promise of respecting the Seoul Convention in specific um, respect of this legislation. Having said all of that, and given the experience now of Seoul being breached, I think, seven or eight times, and the UK government carrying on regardless of what the Scottish government or the Welsh government has said in past instances, I think we're having to work on the basis that the UK government might plough on regardless. If they plough on regardless, um, we have a very, very significant challenge, uh, not least because um, 
uh, th this, this will impact right across government. If we think about all of the areas that the Scottish Government has responsibility for, a significant part of which, if not a majority of areas of government responsibility, uh, had a European dimension to it or a European legislative dimension to it. Um, the UK Government, as I've said already, uh, is not in a position to provide or is not prepared to or has not included in it, certainly in its tracker that it has um, that it has established um, to, to point out where the devolved areas um, are impacted. So, you know, we're going to have to go through that phase. Then we're going to have to go through the uh, the phase of working out of how can we retain uh, that legislation on our statute book. And then we're going to have to work out um, how parliamentary time will be used um, in, in all of this. So we're very much at the beginnings of that process, and you know, no doubt, uh, convener, you will have me back soon to talk about this process. I, I heard what you had to say about taking evidence as a committee, and I'll be happy to come back. Um, but it's a very, very fast-moving situation, uh, convener, uh, and uh, there are very significant resource implications um, for ourselves, for our Welsh colleagues, uh, and that resource implication is about uh, having the expertise. Um, and the capacity to go through 47 years of European Union legislation, uh, and then um, the resource implications in terms of parliamentary uh, time in the government's existing legislative uh, programme. So, you know, we're facing a very big uh, challenge as the answer to Dr. Allen's question. Thank you. Can, you know? Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr. Ruskell, please? Yeah, thanks, convener. A um, couple of follow-up questions. So, in relation to the public consultation on the annual report, Cabinet Secretary, presumably if people had concerns about the decision that was made about EVs or anything else that's in the detail of this report, then they can make submissions to that consultation. Is, is that right? I mean, you're looking for active engagement on the decisions that the government had made through the consultation, or, or has it got a different focus? And then what happens to those responses that come in? Does that get passed to the relevant cabinet secretary or, or you know, what, what's the process here for stakeholders? Well, the, the first thing to say is uh, I would very much hope that uh, stakeholders are engaged on an ongoing basis uh, with uh, the, the process of alignment uh, and re remaining aligned with the European uh, Union. Uh, I would very much welcome uh, stakeholders uh, reflecting on decisions that have, have been made, and because it's kind of live and ongoing uh, process rather than being an event, uh, that it's an, it's an iterative um, approach as well. So I would very much welcome uh, stakeholders becoming part of that uh, process. Uh, I, nothing has been flagged to me uh, in relation uh, to uh, the process thus far from, from stakeholders saying that there was uh, too much of something or or too little of something or making specific suggestions about different ways of doing things. But were that to be the case, I have no doubt that it would uh, be influencing uh, the thinking of uh, civil service colleagues. Um, and if en anything was of, um, uh, of significance uh, and, and proportionate commensurate with my responsibilities, that it would be flagged to, to myself. Uh, that I would be looking very closely at that. So through you, it's an opportunity to say to, to others, so stakeholders who do follow these uh, issues, if there are things that they want to reflect on that form part of the report, or there are related issues to uh, realignment more, uh, 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 alignment more generally, then I would very much welcome people's input. Okay, and then obviously the bigger question here then is the retained EU law bill and about how that stakeholder engagement can realistically happen, given the, the immense uh, you know, scope and nature of that work that will potentially have to take place in the next 12 months. Uh, do you have further thoughts then on how you can engage stakeholders in thematic areas as we potentially approach that, oh, I, that cliff edge? Because obviously within Europe this is happening the whole time, there's ongoing stakeholder engagement, but what, how, how do you reach out to to groups and stakeholders at this point around, around the totality of that EU well, law? I mean, I, as I think most, I think most com committee members would probably agree with me when I say that 
uh, sometimes dealing with issues like this can seem a bit dry and distant and, and not have a lot of impact on us, not, not, notwithstanding the fact that we are beginning to look at regulations um, that impact on the likes of drinking water. So that impacts on, on, on all of us. Um, but there's a world of difference between uh, the process of understanding specific and ongoing new proposals emanating uh, from within the European Union and a process which could potentially see the cliff edge, uh, which is, you know, is, is political language for saying the end of uh, legislation uh, that, that has been a part of the of European Union membership over the, the, the past 47 years, that it is of a, it is of a qualitative magnitude, a scale um, so much bigger than uh, trying to deal with um, uh, the sort of month to month current proposals coming out of uh, EU institutions. So again, perhaps through you, convener in the committee, uh, to anybody and everybody uh, who knows and understands the importance of European Union legislation uh, and, and, in effect, the, the high standards and safeguards that it has provided uh, us all, um, that we really, really need to wake up and smell the coffee uh, about what is um, what is uh, coming towards us in terms of this uh, proposal from the UK government. Uh, and uh, I think we are going to have to think very clearly about how do we um, marshal uh, the needs, interests, concerns and expectations of citizens, of, uh, uh, of stakeholders, um, to make sure that as we go through this process, that we are able to protect um, uh, everything that we would wish to protect. And that would certainly be the ambition of, of the Scottish Government. And I imagine that that would be the case uh, for committee members too. Okay, thank you. Um, just one final question. Um, you, you referenced uh, Dr. Whitten's excellent uh, report that was done for the, for the committee. And one of the um, issues that she raises is the potential for passive divergence, particularly when it comes to um, tertiary law, the implementing European Union law. I'm just wondering if you, if you have um, a, a commitment to that tertiary law uh, or, 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 or not. Um, well, the way things uh, currently operate is that there's um, a, a central team in the Scottish Government's Department of External Affairs which works closely with Scotland House in, in Brussels and Scottish Government lawyers in supporting policy directorates uh, to consider the government's policy to maintain advanced EU standards where appropriate. And this team supports this work as part of, of DEX's ongoing business, that is to help enable policy areas to understand the international context um, of their uh, work. Uh, that team helps ensure that policy areas consider where alignment may be possible, how they can support ministerial decision-making and considering alignment alongside the, the range of information and other priorities that government must consider in reaching policy decisions. And my view, is that that has to be across the piece of proposals that are uh, that are emanating from European Union uh, institutions. So if there are particular aspects of European legislation, regulations and directives, and I think everybody in the committee under appreciates the difference between those three uh, 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 types of uh, proposals that emanate from the European Union, uh, that we have to make sure that we are capturing those across the piece. So I'm very interested by uh, the professors um, uh, highlighting that that issue and would want to make sure that we are um, able to ensure that we, we have an understanding across the full range of European Union proposals to make sure that there is no uh, passive drift. And I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing exactly what uh, she had to say, but uh, 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 sort of unconscious drift um, in terms of alignment. And, you know, again, that's a, an area where if there's any particular thinking on, on the committee about the risks of that and how that can be ameliorated, I'd be very, very happy to, to hear those. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that when we receive the government's response. Uh, to that piece of work, but um, back to you, convener, just now. Thank you. Um, I've got two members coming in on a possible supplementary as well, so if you could be succinct where possible, that would be very helpful. Uh, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. Obviously, today's sessions around the Conti Continuity Act draft annual report, uh, we've clearly covered a lot of 
retained EU law. So I think the Cabinet Secretary may have spared himself another appearance on that particular subject. But um, back to this session's um, focus. There's a lack of clarity on Scottish ministers' decision-making process around alignment. And I wondered if you think that the current process around alignment is a transparent one. So I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to be uh, cheeky in, in just saying yes, but my answer is yes. But I, I would stress to Mr. Golden that if there, if there are areas in where um, more transparency, more understanding about the decision-making process uh, is wished for by the committee, as I've said a number of times, I'm, I'm actively and pre prepared to, to consider those and hope that those are the matters that have been discussed um, between our officials. I mean, the short answer to Mr. Golden's question, I know you've asked for, for brevity, convener, and, and my answer is yes. I, I do think that uh, we have a system that is working uh, and that we are finding our best ways through that in being transparent. But if there are specific ways in which that can be improved, I'm open to that as well. I think it would be helpful uh, to understand the process around Scottish ministers uh, monitoring new EU legislation. I think we covered this earlier for possible alignment and how decisions about that, that alignment is made. And I wonder how you could perhaps publish that to make it more transparent. Well, well I, could, I could reread what I just said in a previous answer in relation to how the Scottish Government manages the alignment process in terms of the, the, the central DEXA team. Scotland House colleagues in Brussels, and then Scottish Government lawyers as being um, the three uh, key groups in terms of the, if you want to call it a triage process of, of understanding uh, what is coming towards us. Um, that then uh, goes into the civil service uh, system and uh, is, is then considered uh, within ministerial um, uh, decision making. Um, that that is the way in in which that's the process in in which it, it in which it happens. Um, I, I, I am answerable to Parliament both in terms of this committee and in terms of um, answering uh, questions to members uh, in the chamber as well. So, if people are wanting to ask questions about how decisions have been made or which decisions are being made, in addition to the broad spectrum of ways in which myself and my my civil service colleagues have answered to the committee already. I'm happy to consider that, and if Mr. Golden has any specific examples that he would wish more information about, I would be happy to provide them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, um, I'm very conscious of time. Do, do you have any flexibility on, on when you can stay with I, us? I'm not. I have absolutely no flexibility. I'm literally needing to go straight into my next event in the next door room at Scotland House. Oh, okay. That. That's helpful. Um, I think we, we still have one member. A uh, very quick question from Jenny Mento. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I will be brief. I, I think um, the responses to our questions just highlight how uh, inextricably linked everything around Europe is and what happens in Westminster severely impacts on um, what goes on in Scotland. I, I was interested to hear both you and George McPherson comment on the fact that the Continuity Act isn't the only way that um, we, are, we in Scotland are maintaining um, our links with European law. So I'd be interested if you could maybe just give a couple of examples so that the normal person can put this into perspective. Uh, I'd be happy to, very briefly, if, if I can think of, of some of the areas where um, alignment um, has, has played a factor in thinking. I think uh, the, the very concrete recent example has, has related to uh, the single use of plastic uh, regulations. So, so we're trying to be more environmentally responsible, aren't we? We're trying to make sure that we're not unnecessarily polluting uh, the environment. So stopping uh, producing things made out of, of plastic and then literally throwing them away after we've used them, whether that's cutlery or plates or, or whatever else. Um, is, is probably the most uh, tangible recent example of uh, an area where we have sought to remain uh, aligned with the European Union. We're the first part of uh, the United Kingdom uh, to have, have done that. Um, and we've had to uh, also uh, do that whilst using new mechanisms that have been introduced um, uh, in, 
for a kind of post-Brexit uh, UK. So uh, the, the, the UK Internal um, um, Market Act um, and what are known as the common frameworks, which we've discussed before the committee as well, playing a role in considerations around that. So that would be a very current example of something where we're trying to do our best to maintain the highest standards, and the highest standards we know are the EU standards. So we're doing that. The rest of the UK hasn't done it yet. Um, that is for them to decide about how they want to proceed. But we want to make sure that we're living up to the highest standards that we can. So that's where we're trying to remain aligned with EU policy. And we've done just that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Very conscious of your time. Thank you for attending this morning with your officials. We may well have a, a couple of follow-up questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, um, but this committee will decide that in private session. But thank you for your attention. And we now move into private session.